Good morning, everyone. My name is Duncan Wilson, and I'm Vice President of Environment and External Affairs here at the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that today we're gathered on the traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people and give our thanks to them. Today we're privileged to hear from the Honourable Melanie Jolie, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce her. Since 2015, Minister Jolie has served in a number of ministerial roles, including as Minister of Economic Development, Minister of Tourism, Official Languages and La Francophonie, and Minister of Canadian Heritage. The last time I think we hosted Minister Jolie here at Canada Place was in that capacity uh, for Canada 150. Throughout that time, she has worked to promote Canadian culture, increase the visibility of Canada's tourism sector, and to safeguard Canada's two official languages. In her role as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Jolie works to advance Canada's interest while defending our values and leading Canada's contribution to addressing global challenges. As the federal agency mandated with enabling na this nation's trade through the Port of Vancouver, Canada's largest port, and the gateway to the Indo-Pacific, we too work for the benefit of all Canadians. A big part of how we do this is by enhancing Canada's trade capacity and supply chain resiliency through improvements to digital infrastructure and by working with our partners to build trade-enabling infrastructure projects such as roads, grade separations, and terminals. The Centrum expansion project at DP World Centrum Container Terminal, which you can see right behind you there, uh, is uh, just nearing completion. That project that we've done in partnership with DP World is increasing that container terminal's capacity by 60, 60%, 60 while only increasing the land space by 15, 15.15%. The capacity increase that that terminal is bringing on is already spoken for. So that really speaks to the need for us continuing to build capacity. Another initiative that we're leading to meet increasing demand for container ships through the port is the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project. This project will deliver timely capacity to meet Canada's rapidly growing trade needs and will provide critical supply chain support while importantly protecting our country's trade sovereignty for years to come. Ultimately, we're working to ensure that Canada is prepared to meet its trade, future trade obligations from a position of strength. And I look forward to hearing more from the Minister about her efforts towards the same goal. So please join me in welcoming Minister Melanie Jolie. Well, thank you, Duncan. It's great to be back here indeed. It's been a while. I'm happy to be here with uh, my fantastic colleagues. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to first acknowledge that I stand here on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slater with Toot nations. And I'm glad, of course, to be in Vancouver, in your hometown, Harch, with you, with obviously Mary and Marco. It's great to see you folks on a beautiful Sunday morning. And also with our caucus colleagues from here, Taleb, Wilson, Harm, thank you for being here. Here on the shores of beautiful British Columbia, it is undeniable Canada is a Pacific country. It is most obvious here, but it's true throughout the country. The Indo-Pacific region is part of Canada's DNA. Our long-awaited Indo-Pacific strategy, which we're publishing today, serves to assert that truth, to harness its potential for Canadians now and into the future. Over the past two weeks, you've heard me outline the principles of this strategy in Toronto. In Cambodia, the Prime Minister, Mary and I, elevated our relationship with ASEAN to the level of strategic partner. In Indonesia, we announced $750 million in financing for sustainable infrastructure across the region. And in Thailand, we announced a new series of trade missions, Canada's first agriculture office also in the region, and expanded diplomatic capacity. And today you will see the full picture of how Canada intends not just to engage, but to lead in the midst of a generational global shift. Au cours des deux dernières semaines, vous m'avez entendu exposer les principes de la stratégie du Canada pour l'Indo-Pacifique. Ça a commencé à Toronto et puis par la suite au Cambodge, où Mary et moi étions avec le Premier ministre. Nous avons alors élevé notre relation avec la NASE au rang de partenaire stratégique. En Indonésie, nous avons 
annoncé un financement de 750 millions de dollars pour des infrastructures durables dans toute la région. Et en Thaïlande, nous avons fait l'annonce d'une nouvelle série de missions commerciales et la mise sur pied de notre premier bureau de promotion de l'agriculture dans la région. Nous avons également indiqué que nous allons augmenter notre capacité diplomatique. Aujourd'hui, vous allez voir le portrait complet de la façon dont le Canada a l'intention non seulement de s'engager, mais aussi de mener sa stratégie au milieu d'un changement générationnel mondial. 2022 has shown us that the tectonic plates of the world power structures are moving. China is an increasingly disruptive global power. And as India, the world's largest democracy, becomes the most populous country in the world, its strategic importance and leadership will only increase. The North Pacific, our neighborhood alongside Japan and South Korea, is facing real security threats from North Korea as it continues reckless missile launches, and from China, who continues to challenge international norms. The Indo-Pacific is the fastest growing economic region of the world. By 2030, it will be home to two thirds of the global middle class. And by 2040, it will account for more than half of the global economy. Every issue that matters to Canadians, our national security, our economic prosperity, democratic values, climate change, or again, human rights, will be shaped by the relationship Canada has with Indo-Pacific countries. Toutes les questions qui sont importantes pour les Canadiens, que ce soit notre sécurité nationale ou encore notre prospérité économique, nos valeurs démocratiques, les changements climatiques ou encore les droits de la personne, seront façonnés par les relations que nous aurons avec les pays de la région Indo-Pacifique. These relationships have been built upon a strong foundation. Throughout the Indo-Pacific, Canada is appreciated as a valued trading partner, as a secure investment destination, and also as a stable democracy. But the current moment demands more of Canada. The region is now looking for us to step up our game. They want Canada at the table to build a better future for citizens on both sides of the Pacific. The central tenet of our Indo-Pacific strategy is acting in Canada's national interests without compromising your values. It is about positioning Canada as being a reliable partner now and for generations to come. It is an ambitious plan for the next decade, beginning with a $2.2 billion investment over the next, next five years. Le principe central de notre stratégie Indo-Pacifique consiste en tout temps d'agir dans l'intérêt du Canada. Bien entendu, nous allons le faire tout en défendant nos valeurs. Il s'agit de positionner le Canada comme un partenaire fiable, maintenant et pour la prochaine décennie. Il s'agit d'un plan ambitieux qui commence par un investissement de 2,2 milliards de dollars au cours des cinq prochaines années. The strategy is built around five objectives. First, in response to increasingly complex threat to Canadian security in both physical and digital spaces, we are investing to promote peace and security throughout the region. We are increasing our military presence, increasing also our naval presence in the region. We're bolstering our collaboration with and contribution to the Five Eyes. On foreign interference, the targeting of Canadians will not be tolerated. No effort will be spared to protect Canadians and defend against these threats. My colleague Marco will speak more about that in a second. We're also enhancing our cooperation with Japan and South Korea in the North Pacific, which is the gateway to the Arctic. And as climate change redraw maritime routes and major countries look to the North, we will continue to protect the Arctic and uphold our Arctic sovereignty. More Canadian men and women in uniform will be in the region to ensure peace and ensure also to uphold the rule of law. Secondly, to capture the economic potential that comes with the rapid growth of the Indo-Pacific, we're investing to create trade opportunities for Canadian businesses to diversify and bring more of Canada to new markets. 
more Canadian entrepreneurs will be on the ground to promote all that Canada has to offer. And this will mean more jobs for Canadians here at home. My colleague Mary will have more to say on that also in a second. Thirdly, we're connecting our people, which are at the heart of our relationships with the region. We're strengthening our international assistance and protecting human rights. And my colleague Harge, my friend Harge, also will address this issue. We will expand the number of scholarships available. We will see more students from ASEAN countries on our campuses and more Canadians on theirs. We'll also bolster visa capacity in New Delhi, in Chandigarh, in Manila, as well as in Islamabad, making it easier for more families to visit Canada. Fourth, as a country with a coastline sparing three oceans, we understand the impact of climate change on not just the health of our planet, but also on its stability. That's why we're investing to build a green and sustainable future in the region. Indo-Pacific countries will have access to more Canadian expertise to tackle this existential threat, including in areas such as ocean management. Finally, we're also answering the call for regional partner for expanded and deepened engagement. We'll appoint a special envoy for the Indo-Pacific region to coordinate our approach, managing the, implement the implementation of this strategy. And we'll have more resources in key embassies, more Canadians at the table to defend Canadians' interests. La stratégie du Canada pour l'Indo-Pacifique s'articule au cours autour de cinq objectifs. Premièrement, en réponse aux menaces de plus en plus complexes qui pèsent sur la sécurité canadienne, que ce soit dans les espaces physiques ou même numériques, nous investissons pour promouvoir la paix et la stabilité dans la région. Nous augmentons notre présence militaire, ce qui se traduira notamment par une présence navale accrue. Deuxièmement, afin de développer le potentiel économique qui découle de la croissance rapide de la région, nous allons créer davantage de débouchés commerciaux pour les gens de chez nous. Troisièmement, nous allons investir dans l'aide au développement et la défense des droits de la personne. Ensuite, nous allons offrir davantage de solutions pour lutter contre les changements climatiques et mitiger ses impacts. Et enfin, nous répondons présents à la demande, à l'appel des partenaires régionaux. Nos missions diplomatiques vont être renforcées et nous allons voir l'arrivée de nouveaux personnels pour veiller aux intérêts des Canadiens. Pour faire face à ce moment charnière, nous devons renforcer nos amitiés existantes. Nous devons aussi élargir notre coalition d'État. To meet this moment, we must reinforce our existing friendship, and I would say also broaden our coalition of states. As we look out to the horizon of the Indo-Pacific, we can see the importance of what lays ahead for Canadians and for the people of every nation in the region. The future of the Indo-Pacific is our future, and we have a role to play in shaping it. To do so, we need to be a true and reliable partner. For us to succeed, it will take hard work, humility, and ambition. Today, we're putting forward a truly Canadian strategy, one that involves every facet of our society. It sends a clear message to the region that Canada is here, and they can trust that we're here to stay. Thank you so much. And now I pass the mic to my friend, Mary Ying. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie. <clears throat> and it's uh, terrific to be here in Vancouver. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. And it's great to be here with you, Mel, with Marco, with, uh, with Harj. And uh, let me just um, acknowledge that we are gathered here on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples, Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and the Musqueam nations. And as Minister Jolie just said, she and I uh, just returned from a very successful trip with the Prime Minister last week at, uh, at the ASEAN Leader Summit, 
the G20 as well as APEC meetings where we were able to at that time highlight some key initiatives of the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And following that successful trip, it's very fitting that we are here in Vancouver, British Columbia, where in the 1700s, people from Asia came to the shores of Canada and created one of the most vibrant Asian Canadian populations on this side of the Pacific Ocean. And it is here that I'm so thrilled to be with my colleagues to announce um, the or unveil what uh, you've heard from Minister Jolie, which is the comprehensive Indo-Pacific strategy. Nearly one in five Canadians trace their heritage to the Indo-Pacific region, giving Canada one of the most established diaspora communities in the world. Asian Canadians have made incredible contributions to our country and indeed to the world. The foundation of this people-to-people -people ties is Canada's strength. We can work together to partner with people around the world because Canadians come from around the world. See, they agree with us too, right, Plain? Mm. And that is our secret weapon, our people, the Canadian people. So why the Indo-Pacific and why now? Um, Minister Jolie laid out um, how important the region is. And as the trade minister, many of you have heard me say that one in six jobs in Canada depends on international trade. And it means that they depend on more than just the strength and the security of Canada's economy alone, but it depends on the economies of around the world. And the fact is that Canada offers vast geography and resources, but as a population, we're relatively small. We are under 40 million people, which is less than 1% of the entire Indo-Pacific. To secure this economic future, we need to have strong trading relationships and partners around the world to protect our jobs and our businesses here at home. As the minister already laid out, the Indo-Pacific is among the fastest growing region in the world, and in just seven years from now, in 2030, it's going to be home to two-thirds of the global middle class. And by 2040, it will account for over half of the world's GDP. I wasn't as smart as Minister Jolie. Mine is in paper. <laughs> so if it falls away, you'll, you, you, know, you might not get the whole thing. Um, but what this means is that every issue that matters to Canadian, our economy, our good middle class jobs, our democratic values, our national security, and our human rights, it's going to be shaped by our relationship with the Indo-Pacific, which is why this strategy is just so important. And our work in the region is critical to our future prosperity and stability. And it's remarkable to think about, uh, you know, about being on planes because uh, I've spent um, 11 times, I can't believe it, this year in the region from Indonesia to the Philippines to India and more. And I've seen the firsthand opportunities to develop those partnerships to improve the lives and the business opportunities on both sides of the Pacific. Whether it's Durham wheat at the ports of Jakarta for one of the largest milling operations in the world, to the longest skyway in Manila, Philippines, designed by incredible Canadian engineering talent, to the Canadian AI solution deployed by ASEAN to detect and proactively manage COVID-19 during the pandemic for 650 million people. Canada is present and active. And the impact of our relationships can be seen both here at home and abroad. Who doesn't know Jolly Bee, which is a signature restaurant chain in the Philippines that is now becoming a mainstream brand here in Canada. The CP Group, which is one of Thailand's largest companies, is investing in Canadian agri-food production and seeking to leverage our clean energy mix on their journey to net zero. This is what I mean. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. <laughs> you I bet you haven't seen an announcement looking like that before. Uh, Canada is already working with the Indo-Pacific, making our economy stronger and more resilient, and we're taking concrete steps to go further. Uh, let me just highlight for you the trade elements of this strategy. The Indo-Pacific is looking for trusted, credible, and reliable partners. They're urgently looking for partners to address their acute food, energy, mineral, infrastructure, and technology, human capital, and consumer needs on both a strategic and a sustainable basis. Canada is uniquely ready and positioned to meet these needs. And with trade at the heart of the Indo-Pacific strategy, we will deliver on these ambitions with a number of key initiatives. First, we will focus Canada's presence in the region by establishing a new Canada trade gateway in Southeast Asia that will be Canada's front door to the region to help businesses expand, innovate, 
and to harness investment opportunities. We will appoint a new Canadian Indo-Pacific trade representative to advance and lead economic partnerships and cooperation in the region. We will take Canadian businesses to the Indo-Pacific through a new series of large-scale trade missions using a modernized Team Canada missions approach, working with um, provinces and territories focused on inclusive trade, so that's women entrepreneurs, SMEs, and on sectors where Canada has a competitive advantage. We're going to expand Can Export to help businesses access the opportunities in the region, whether it is to attend trade shows, secure IP, or to do market research and promotion. We're also going to invest to strengthen the network of Canadian chambers of commerce who are already operating in the Indo-Pacific and to unlock that incredible potential and passion of our expat community that is everywhere throughout the Indo-Pacific. We're going to enhance our capacity, as Minister Jolie said, um, by having the first ever agriculture and agri-food office in the region. And through a new Canada-India desk, we will fully realize the commercial and trade opportunities with the world's largest democracy. And to support the region's need for high quality, sustainable infrastructure partners, we'll invest $750 million, uh, which we've already shared, uh, into FinDev for infrastructure projects in the Indo-Pacific to maximize the trade to development nexus, which I know uh, I'm so looking forward to working with Minister Harj Sajjan on, uh, to further unlock the large scale investment by working with Canadian pension funds who already have some of the largest private sector investors in the region. And second, we're gonna enhance rules-based trade to provide predictability for economies and exporters. In my first trip to the Indo-Pacific this year, I launched negotiations towards an early progress trade agreement with India, which will help businesses access that incredible market of 1.4 billion consumers. Our government is also negotiating ambitious and progressive free trade agreements with the ASEAN and Indonesia, as well as advancing discussions around the Indo-Pacific economic framework. And we will continue to work with our CPTPP partners to ensure that any form of expansion will be based on high standards and track record. The CPTPP is a high standards agreement rooted in rules that uphold labor and environmental standards designed to ensure that the benefits of trade are felt by everyone. Today, our CPTPP partners recognize the values. Thanks so much, Mel. <laughs> Today, our CPTPP partners recognize the value and success of progressive and inclusive trade and we're committed to upholding these high standards that represent all of our values. Trade agreements and international standards are what underpin the rules-based trading system and uphold our values. They make us stronger, more prosperous for all of our economies. So just to conclude, we've got four objectives in this Indo-Pacific strategy as it relates to trade. Expand our trade network here at home and abroad, enhance rules-based trade that provides predictability for economies and for exporters, ensure the resiliency of our supply chains, increase export diversification and free trade access. And Canadians expect us to have an ambitious, cleared-eyed, comprehensive plan, and that's exactly what our government is doing. So to our businesses and to our entrepreneurs around the country, know that your government is supporting you every step of the way to start up, to scale up, and to access new markets in the Indo-Pacific. And to the millions of Asian Canadians in Canada, know that this strategy is a recognition of how much potential we have to contribute to our country. And that any form of anti-Asian racism is unacceptable. This is a strategy for all Canadians, including our future generations, whose livelihoods will depend on how Canada today chooses to engage in this region. I'm very excited to be working with my colleagues on this exciting strategy to grow today's economy, and to protect the jobs of the future. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to be... I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded, ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh First Nations. And as my colleagues have already stated, Canada is a Pacific nation. 
and as a minute as a minute one of the ministers and members of parliament from bc and having also some of my pacific caucus colleagues here we are very proud of our people to people ties uh, with the indo-pacific region now we have a long history as uh, minister ng has already outlined a strong partnership with the indo-pacific region that we have built on uh, international assistance engagements throughout decades Now, despite decades of growth, poverty and inequality remain realities for far too many. Now, Canada is committed to being an active, engaged, and reliable partner in the region. We continue to work with our country's partners to identify their needs. Now, this is where we can have the greatest impact on poverty reduction that aligns with our foreign policy, trade, and economic goals. We will enhance our partnership with middle-income countries and foster new opportunities with small island states. Our feminist international assistance policy provides the framework to address deeply entrenched poverty throughout the region. We will seek to foster and a, co a coherent approach to development and efforts to create positive economic uh, effects for developing country partners. Now, to achieve, to achieve this, we have allocated $100 million for a responsive bilateral assistance programming package and $750 million uh, to FinDev Canada through re recapitalization. Now, through targeted investments in programming in the trade development nexus, we will support country-led efforts to generate sustained and inclusive economic growth. And we will support innovative approaches to development that, uh, that involve partnership that empower the poor, particularly women and indigenous peoples. Now, this is how we will achieve our sustainable development goals together. The Indo-Pacific Indo region includes nearly two thirds of the world's ocean and is among one of the mo uh, most vulnerable uh, globally to the effects of climate change and especially the small island states. Now, Canada itself is, a, is no stranger to climate-induced uh, disasters. And under this strategy, we will leverage our lessons learned in this area to support partners in the region. More spe uh, specifically, we will establish a $52.4 million signature initiative in the region on disaster, uh, disaster risk and resilience. We will share Canadian expertise and build capacity in Pacific with Pacific nations so they can be ready to respond to climate change-induced disasters. We must also acknowledge the fragility of democracies and the threats which is, uh, which is putting uh, the rules-based international order at risk. Now, this is where can, uh, Canadian civil societies have a lot to offer, and we have allocated $32 million for a call for proposals strictly for Canadian civil society organizations. And in addition, we are investing $13 million to the Canada Asia uh, Plan uh, Action Trust Fund and $14 million to the Seed Scholarship Fund as well. And through these international assistance, uh, assistance investments, we are demonstrating our commitments to partnership in the Indo-Pacific region, where we can work in partnership with them. Canada has always been there in times of need, and we will continue to be. Now, I've, uh, now I will pass the mic on to my good friend and the Minister of Public Safety, Marco Mendicino. Uh, merci, Harj. Uh, bon matin, tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Duncan and the entire team here at Port of Vancouver for the very um, kind welcome and for the Indigenous land acknowledgement. Um, I also uh, want to say what an honor and a privilege it is to be here with uh, Mel, Mary, Harj, Talib, uh, Wilson, and Parm, all of whom are part of the exceptional team that have put so much work into today's important announcement. Canada's prosperity, position, and contributions to peace and stability in the world is linked to the Indo-Pacific. The strategy we are unveiling today looks to strengthen Canada's role in the region through deepened relations, economic ties, trade, investment, immigration, and innovation that will foster a green and sustainable future. And as we look to implement the Indo-Pacific strategy, 
One of the key features of our approach is how we are integrating Canada's national security interests as a pillar in this strategy. As Minister of Public Safety, I want to focus on how Canada will promote peace, resilience, and security in the region. En tant que ministre de la Sécurité publique, je veux me concentrer sur un autre pilier de cette stratégie, la promotion de la paix, de la résilience et de la sécurité. In the decades since the end of the Cold War, the focus of our country's national security has evolved along with the geopolitical landscape. The Indo-Pacific region is home to some of our closest allies and key strategic partnerships. It is, at the same time, a part of the world where we also see some of our greatest challenges. That's why the landmark strategy we are announcing today necessarily includes security as a key pillar. To protect Canada's national security, we must be vigilant against the very real and serious threats of foreign interference, cyber attacks, hostile activities, ideological extremism, disinformation, and international crime networks which impact the integrity of our borders. Public safety, law enforcement, and the security and intelligence community stands at the ready to meet those challenges. And I will now outline the significant long-term investments, resources, and tools the Indo-Pacific strategy will allocate to strengthen our security posture in the region. First, we're investing over $60 million to enhance CSIS's intelligence capabilities in the region. Premièrement, nous renforçons la présence du SCRS dans la région grâce à un nouveau financement de plus de 60 millions de dollars. The investments will better position Canada to identify, understand, and counter the security challenges emanating from the region and deepen our relations as a reliable intelligence partner. Deuxièmement, nous améliorons la cybersécurité grâce au financement d'une initiative de diplomatie et de sécurité cybernétique par la GRC et mon ministère. Secondly, we're strengthening Canada's cybersecurity with the creation of a cyber diplomacy and security initiative, which the RCMP and Public Safety Canada will support through an investment of nearly $18 million. With these funds, we will promote responsible cyber governance, expand cooperation with regional law enforcement and intelligence partners, and coordinate efforts to detect and combat foreign interference that will help to protect and advance our national interests. These initiatives build on our national cyber security strategy, including the recent introduction of Bill C-26, which is historic legislation to protect our critical infrastructure against cyber attacks. Thirdly, thirdly the strategy will further leverage our international law enforcement network with funding for the RCMP and CBSA to work with counterparts across the region to advance bilateral cooperation. Troisièmement, nous approfondissons les relations avec un nouveau financement pour la GRC et l'ASFC afin qu'elles puissent travailler avec leurs homologues dans toute la région. Canada enjoys a very positive and productive relationship with our Five Eyes partners, as well as other key allies like Japan, Korea, and many others. This new funding will help countries to build capacity to take action on critical priorities, including border security, financial crimes, cyber, forced labor, human trafficking, money laundering, and of course, counterterrorism. It will also help the CBSA strike more bilateral agreements and the RCMP to work with local law enforcement. And notre engagement accru dans la région intéressa nos alliés, puisque nous nous préparons à présider la réunion ministérielle de saint p en 2023, un forum permette au ministère de la Sécurité de l'Alliance de Groupe de Cinq de se rencontrer et de discuter les possibilités de la collaboration. La sécurité doit être au premier plan alors que nous favorisons la prospérité, l'inclusion et la durabilité. This morning, you've heard my colleagues give a variety of versions and approaches that are all built along the same theme. Canada is a Pacific nation. 
We're excited about the opportunities that lie on the horizon for Canada by strengthening our ties to the Indo-Pacific region. Economic prosperity, trade, innovation, jobs, people-to-people -people bonds, promoting an inclusive, green, and sustainable world for all, all of which is underpinned by an integrated approach when it comes to protecting our national security. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Nous pouvons maintenant prendre des questions des médias. Nous vous demandons de poser une question et une question de suivi. We'll now take questions from the media. We ask that you ask one question and one follow-up question, and we ask that your questions remain concise. Unless there's questions from participants on site, we'll begin with those on the phone line. On va commencer avec les questions des participants sur la ligne téléphonique, à moins qu'il y ait des questions des participants ici présents. So please state your name, your organization, and to which minister you are asking your question. Operator, please proceed with the first question. Thank you. Merci. We will now take questions from the telephone line. If you have a question, please press star 1 on the device's keypad. On est maintenant passé à la période des questions. Si vous voulez poser une question, s'il vous plaît, puis sur les touches étoiles 1 de votre appareil. We will be brief pause while the participants register. Nous allons courir délai pour mettre en enregistré dans la file d'attente pour la période de questions. The first question, la première question, de Gabriel Proux, Radio-Canada. À vous la parole. Bonjour, Mme Jolie. Euh, vous dites que la stratégie Indo-Pacifique du Canada a été construite en ayant en tête la Chine. Euh, Croyez-vous que la stratégie elle, va aider le Canada à être davantage pris au sérieux par la Chine? Mais je pense que de façon générale, notre objectif est d'être non seulement ferme, mais de défendre nos intérêts nat nationaux. Donc, on ne sera jamais, euh, on n'aura jamais à s'excuser pour défendre notre intérêt national. On sera toujours là pour défendre également nos valeurs. Et en même temps, maintenant, on a un cadre clair, un cadre transparent, qui fait en sorte que lorsqu'on s'engage au niveau diplomatique, parce que je pense que la diplomatie est une force, mais à ce moment-là, les attentes sont claires. Alors, ce sera la façon dont on va faire avec la Chine. Merci. Et si je peux me permettre une question de relance, comment est-ce qu'on réussit à être aussi proche du Japon, de la Corée du Sud, que de l'Allemagne, la France et la Grande-Bretagne? Mais on est déjà très impliqué euh, avec le Japon et la Corée. Si on regarde les, les partenaires commerciaux dans la région, le Japon est le deuxième euh, partenaire commercial le plus important. Euh, le, G, le, le Japon fait partie du G7 euh, et on a quand même euh, des communautés japonaises et coréennes très importantes au Canada. Euh, J'étais là dans la région euh, au Japon et en Corée il y a un mois. Le, mon collègue euh, François-Philippe Champagne était là la semaine dernière. Ma collègue Mary s'en va au Japon la semaine prochaine. Bref, notre objectif est d'être très proche de ces deux, de, de ces deux pays-là. Et euh, vous, vous verrez dans la stratégie Indo-Pacifique à quel point nous voulons accentuer notre relation également au niveau sécurité et également au niveau euh, commercial. Merci. Prochaine question, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Dylan Robertson from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. The line is open. Hi there. Uh, Minister Jody and Minister Mendocino, why are we not committing to a registry of foreign agents? Well, the first thing I would highlight is that we will uh, never tolerate foreign interference of any variety. And we have already uh, invested and put into place some very concrete tools to ensure that our national security apparatus has the capacity to both uh, detect uh, and interrupt uh, foreign interference uh, in all of its various forms. I, I would begin by highlighting the legislation that our government introduced and passed in 2019 under Bill C-59, which equipped CSIS with uh, new authorities to engage in threat reduction measures, while at the same time um, guaranteeing that we have transparency and accountability when those uh, powers and authorities are used to interrupt potential threats to our national security through the creation of NSERA. You also heard throughout my remarks that we have a national uh, cybersecurity strategy, which uh, will manifest in the passage of Bill C-26 as well. 
And this is landmark legislation because it looks to identify a number of key critical infrastructure areas, including the financial sector, the telecommunications sector, the innovation sector, and the transportation sector, all of which will uh, work very closely with the private sectors and the implicated federal regulators in that space to make sure that we can guard against foreign interference. And what you hear today is that we are putting in place an Indo-Pacific strategy which looks to leverage the many opportunities that exist economically through our key strategic partnerships and allies in that region. Uh, but woven throughout that strategy is an integrated approach when it comes to our national security. Now, of course, uh, we remain uh, very open to always examining uh, new threats as uh, they uh, materialize on the national security landscape. And of course, uh, we are uh, in the throes of, of discussing a wide range of, of options, including potentially uh, the creation of a foreign agent registry. But I want to assure all Canadians uh, that we are on guard against those threats, that we have put in place the tools that are necessary to mitigate against those threats, and we will continue to do so through the launch of this important strategy today. Thank you. And Minister Zoli, in Thailand, the Prime Minister announced close to 60 new diplomatic positions. And I'm looking at the strategy and the annex, and there's actually no target stated. So is the 60 number still relevant, or do you not have a target anymore? The goal is to increase the diplomatic capacity, Dylan, because we believe that Canada needs to step up its game in the region. We're giving, uh, we're putting $100 million uh, to it. It is the first uh, biggest investment in uh, diplomacy in years. What you're seeing today is a reorientation of our foreign policy we haven't seen in a long time. Why? Because there's a generational global shift happening. And so we're proud of this new strategy that was developed by all of us working as a team. And we think also that it is a strong message we're sending to uh, the region and to our diplomats. I would like to add to that, that last night I had the chance to talk with all of our head of missions in the region. All of them were there, uh, very excited, I must say, about this new investment, very interested in knowing all the details of the strategy, which are now highlighted. And the goal now is to be in implementation mode. So that will be the focus as we communicate to Canadians, to the region, to the world, what we're doing we also want to make sure that uh, teams on the ground have the resources required to be able to fulfill this ambitious plan. Thank you. Operator, we'll move to the next question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, the next question, is de Clara Tescurmez, La Presse Canadienne. À vous la parole. Euh, bonjour. Donc, c'est quand même beaucoup d'investissements avec de la participation de plusieurs ministères. Je me demandais le près de 2,3 milliards de dollars sur 5 ans. Pouvez-vous faire un petit recap de d'où vient cet argent-là exactement? Oui, Clara. Mais écoute, il y a cinq objectifs dans la stratégie. Le premier, c'est lié à la paix et la sécurité. Euh, Là-dedans, on a à peu près 700-750 millions d'investissements, que ce soit au niveau militaire ou encore au niveau euh, renseignement et sécurité. Marco en a parlé tantôt au niveau sécurité, et, euh, mais... Ce qu'on remarque, c'est qu'il y a surtout une frégate de plus qui va être dans la région de nos forces armées canadiennes. Euh, aussi, nous investissons particulièrement dans un fonds d'infrastructure verte qui a été présenté autant par Mary que par Harge. Euh, c'est un fonds pour aider à déployer du capital dans la région, alors que plusieurs pays qui sont à la recherche d'investissements en infrastructure. Du reste, tu vas avoir de l'argent aussi au niveau euh, de la question d'augmenter nos ressources diplomatiques dans la région, davantage aussi de soutien à tout ce qui est organisation civile pour défendre les droits de la personne, aider des experts aussi à être dans la région pour aider à résoudre des tensions, parfois même des conflits associés au respect euh, du droit de la mer et au respect, en fait, des frontières qui sont parfois, euh, comment je pourrais dire, contestées par différents pays, en particulier la Chine. Euh, oui, d'accord, mais ces, ces nouveaux investissements-là, ils viennent de quelle, euh, de quelle source, en fait? Oui, donc, Clara, c'est de la nouvelle argent. Donc, c'est 2,3 milliards euh, oui. de dollars qui ont été approuvés par le premier ministre. Et donc, c'est un investissement sur cinq ans.
Thank you. We'll move Thank to the you. next question. Merci. The next question is from Christian Boslang from CBC News. Please go ahead. Line is open. Hi, Minister Jolie. Uh, can you describe how you would characterize uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy when it comes to our long-standing or our, our previous approach to China? It, would you say it's a significant change or consistent? How would you describe it? Well, you know, I think we'll never uh, have to apologize for defending our national interests and without compromising our values. This is the central tenet of the Indo-Pacific strategy. And now, when it comes to China, we have a clear framework uh, when it comes to dealing with the government of China. And uh, we will engage in diplomacy because we think diplomacy is a strength. At the same time, we'll be firm. And that's why we have now a very transparent uh, plan to engage with China. Uh, to follow up, are you worried about the risk that China might, uh, uh, that there might be blowback from China because of some of the, you know, rhetoric that uh, you guys have used in the strategy, such as increasingly disruptive global power? Well, this is in line with what many of our partners around the world have stated even recently. I must add that in the NATO latest strategic concept back in June, China is now for the first time highlighted as an issue for NATO. So uh, I'm heading uh, to NATO next week, uh, leaving here and heading to Europe, and we'll be definitely talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy and the, our China policy with our European allies and friends. And also, uh, Mary is heading to Japan. Francois-Philippe Champagne was just in Japan and Korea. Our goal is to be extremely close to these countries as well. Thank you. We'll go to the next question, and Thanks. this will be our last question. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Murad Hemani from The Logic. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, Hi, uh, Minister Jolie, uh, my question is for you. Uh, the strategy cites the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, the first round of IPAF negotiations uh, is in Brisbane in two weeks, uh, and only members can attend, so Canada won't be at the table. Has Canada secured promises to support our membership bid from any country other than the U.S. and Japan, and how can we ensure our interests are secured if we can't participate in negotiations? Well, thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, obviously, we are happy uh, to be uh, joining IPAF. Uh, as mentioned, when uh, my colleague Tony Blinken was in Ottawa, uh, the Secretary of State from the US, uh, well, obviously, we have the support from uh, the Americans. We have the support from Japan. We had a good conversation also with India and many other countries. I think the reaction is extremely positive, and I'm very optimistic, but I'll add maybe um, Mary, you can add to that. Hi, Murad. Uh, good to hear from you on a sunny, sunny Sunday morning. We wish you were here joining us. A little bit cold. You wouldn't be able to tell if you were not here. <laughs> Although, I bet you that he is colder where he is. Um, but, um, but as Minister Jolie said, um, we are having some very productive conversations. Let me also share that uh, Canada is a part of the CPTPP. And we are working with already many of the countries who are a part of this framework. And we work very closely with the United States. So we're very confident that um, we're going to do this work with uh, our partners, our colleagues, and the United States, and, uh, and to continue to work uh, together, as you are seeing in this Indo-Pacific strategy, to advance our economic interests and to create greater opportunities. And I think we can uh, do that uh, together, and we can certainly do that with our partners uh, in the United States and our, our, our partners and colleagues in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Minister Ng, while I've got you up there, uh, you mentioned getting Canadian pension funds to invest in infrastructure in Asia as part of this strategy. Uh, your government is also trying to get them to invest in infrastructure and clean tech projects here in Canada. Uh, there's only so much capital to go around, so how are you going to get them to do both at the same time? Well, it's interesting you ask that question because it is, in fact, the investors who came to us. There are immense needs for infrastructure, particularly green infrastructure, and 
infrastructure that will help build towards climate resiliency in the region. So if you take a look at Philippines um, as just one country in the region, we've already launched an initiative called Can Build, which includes um, the EDC and CCC working directly with that country. And what they're looking for is they're looking for some additional assistance that will help provide some concessional financing uh, to help then make the project a commercially viable one to which then our very important pension money and funding can go into projects such as this. So I'm thrilled to be working with my colleague um, in Minister Sajjan because this is this is a practical example of how you um, how you explain the development to trade nexus. Being able to provide that capacity through FinDev that will provide concessionality on the one hand, but then having these really important uh, commercial players uh, be a part of the financing actually then makes that project a viable project. And Canada is very keen to be a part of that because we want to be a part of the climate solutions particularly the infrastructure green build fine, um, uh, uh, solutions that are in the region. If I bring it home to Canada, this means terrific Canadian firms who operate in the region through provision of services like engineering services, consulting services, design services, which we are already seeing. Great um, SMEs that are in that value chain that are providing green uh, clean tech solutions as part of those infrastructure projects. So we often, you hear us talk about the environment and the economy going hand in hand. Sure does here in Canada and it sure will in the Indo-Pacific. Good, hello. Are we, are we done, Alien? Okay, folks, so we can give you a copy of the Indo-Pacific strategy and eat donuts all together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Thank you all.